um, at RGSL, although held here uh, technically on the premises of uh, Stockholm School of Economics in Riga. But um, uh, today uh, I'm really uh, honored uh, to present a speaker uh, uh, that many of you know very well, but um, um, I think um, both his persona and his experience uh, is uh, really a pleasure to enjoy. Um, uh, Egil Slevitz is, uh, is a lawyer, I think, but he often calls him uh, a political scientist as well, uh, which uh, is very uh, warm to my heart. Um, and uh, he's uh, an expert, uh, first and foremost, on constitutional law. Um, and um, he uh, has been serving on the uh, uh, Court of Justice of the European Union since 2004 and has been uh, uh, nominated for another term in uh, 2017. Um, he uh, is uh, known um, as an author of, or should I say, author of the preamble of the Constitution of Latvia that was, uh, was adopted uh, a few years ago. And uh, overall, he has very, very rich uh, experience uh, in, in this field. Uh, I believe uh, he is essentially at the heart of the uh, European system of justice and therefore uh, I am honored and proud uh, to present him uh, uh, for today's lecture on uh, law, technology and democracy. Why is it important? I don't think I need to explain to this audience. Uh, professor, the floor is yours. So I should uh, so, um, their colleagues and friends. First, uh, the usual disclaimer: I am not representing the European Court of Justice or uh, the European Union. I am representing myself as a usual lawyer and politologist. And all things that I will say will be my own and it's not binding for the institution. And sometimes I would mark this as my thoughts is, are different from the institution. Um, first of all, I uh, would like to thank the Riga Graduate School of Law for the opportunity to share with you some thoughts about new, recently aroused threats of a modern, for a modern democratic constitutional state, as provided for and deserved both by the Latvian Constitution and by the Treaty of the European Union. At the beginning, I would remind the assessment of the first German Chancellor, Konrad Adenauer, after the re-establishment of democracy in western part of Germany after the Second World War. And he says that the democracy is always in danger. That means that the democracy is not self-evident. Indeed, democracy in modern sense exists only in a historically short period of time and covers only a minor part of the currently existing states and less than one third of the world population. So we should restrict our, uh, our thinking about democracy if we are thinking in global terms. A well-functioning modern democracy deserves many preconditions, despite the fact that normally we are not thinking and caring about them. However, it should be bared in mind that democracy is a very fragile form of government. Under the impression of the democratic revolutions in the previous socialist countries and in other parts of the world, 1992, the American 
political scientist Francis Fukuyama predicted the end of the history because of the victory of the democracy in the whole world, which should happen soon. Now we can see that this prediction is uh, not, not through. On the contrary, we are now in the situation where the Democrats should reflect how to defend this form of government, which indeed, at least in my view, until now is the best form of historically existing governmental forms. I would like first to share with you some thoughts about my reflections, uh, some of my reflections about the actual problems of uh, the developed constitutional democracy, namely the specific threats stemming from the increased uncontrolled use and misuse of the informational technology. So uh, if I'm speaking about technology, I will mean informational technology, IT technology. And uh, finally, I will say maybe some proposals how to deal with these threats. So I will um, first explain uh, why uh, the technology is influencing also uh, the social, uh, social uh, relations uh, between the people, between the individuals. The normative approach of the uh, democracy states that the democracy is a form of collective self-government of citizens. The citizens are forming the civil society as a base for the democratic form of government. The citizen as is a model for a certain political behavior, the citizen, of an individ individual which is characteristic for democracy and only for democracy. The behavior of a citizen is a normative construction based on certain values which are accepted by the Western society as axiomatic. These values are deeply evaluated and described especially in the French constitutional law and named Republican, Republican values. And also in Latvian constitution we have the word Republic. Uh, it, it is the value of uh, the notion Republic in Latvian constitution is until now not evaluated, but uh, the, the word, the notion Republic has a deep sense and this is my suggestion to the constitutional lawyers to go deeper into this notion, the republic. And that means to discover also in Latvian constitutional uh, framework uh, the republican values. But I said that is a normative approach. We should have these republican values and uh, we should have uh, the democracy as provided for in this normative construction of the constitutional democratic state. But, however, the social reality is different. In order to behave like a free citizen, there are specific political, social and legal preconditions. The basic normative precondition is the assumption that all human beings have a free will. Free will. We all know that there is an ongoing discussion whether they really have or have not a free will. This discussion is particularly intensive in natural sciences like psychology, biology, and other on one side, and the philosophy on the other side. <coughs> However, and this is important, the law and the normative political science is not taking part in this discussion, whether the human beings have or have not a free will. They simply postulates that each human being has a free will. And therefore, we are not going to the question, it's which is a very important question, but we will not touch it, whether there exists a free will or, or not. The two most important preconditions for the free will in normative sense um, is first, also in all in normative framework, first the real political rights 
and second, the private sphere of the individuals. Two preconditions, and then we have, we have the possibility in, uh, to have free will as citizens. Both preconditions are complementary. The political guarantees that the political will of the citizens could be freely expressed and therefore realized in the practice. The private sphere guarantees that uh, the free will of citizens could be built free and auton autonomously without undue influence from outside. And the problem is undue influence. For the system of democracy, which is based on the normative assumption of the free will of citizens, both preconditions are obligatory. The political rights, like freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of conscience and religions, uh, are in Western constitutional democracies guaranteed by constitution and really guarded by the independent judiciary. By all criticism, we can say that in the, so to say, classical democracies, the first precondition, so to say, uh, the um, political freedoms are guaranteed. On the contrary, the second precondition for the free will of citizens, the privacy, is nowadays really in danger. And if we say so, that means that also the democratic, uh, the demo, uh, the democratic way of the building of free will is in, in danger. We can only laugh uh, when we are reading the promises of the constitutions which are formulated in the 20th century in this respect. For example, Article 96 of the Latvian Constitution. I quote, everyone has the right to inviolability of his or her private life, home, and correspondence. A similar constitutional provision, provisions we can uh, discover in the most democratic constitutions. However, what for uh, inviolability of private life when our communications, our physical movements are permanently recorded and spied on? What for uh, inviolability of correspondence when our emails and phone conversations, our contacts in our smartphones are legally and illegally with our formal consent or without it, collected and analyzed by both, by public entities and especially by globally acting private concerns. The weakening of the private sphere and being under permanent surveillance has important consequences for the behavior of the citizens. It is well known psychological fact that a person who is permanently under surveillance and who knows that behaves differently as a person who feels himself free. The surveillance of a person creates a chilling effect to the will of the person to do or to say something. Such a result is not compatible with the fundamental right for, for a free development of personality, which is enshrined not in, uh, in the text, but is enshrined uh, um, in, in the Latvian Constitution in Article uh, 89, in the European uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights, and in the most other constitutions. All authoritarian regimes are putting the citizens under surveillance exactly because of this chilling effect. A person under surveillance will therefore behave more in line with mainstream and less auto autonomously. That is exact the aim of an intense surveillance in an authoritarian regime. On the contrary, a democracy should be very sensible in this respect. To sum up, the tolerance of such chilling effects to the free uh, expression of the will of the citizens could be regarded as an infringement of democratic principles and political rights of the citizens. Um, there is an interesting social experiment in China. There is a Chinese colleagues. No, <laughs> I don't. Uh, in two provinces, uh, there is, since two years, there is an experiment, a so-called um, citizens' ranking system. Um, and 
2020, uh, this citizens' ranking should, uh, system should be introduced in, 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 the, whole, in, in, in the whole country. In, that means that uh, the behavior of the citizen, private and public behavior, uh, is uh, ranked by points. You can reach 1,000 point by absolute, um, so to say, uh, a behavior which is without any, any problem, without any, any fault. This is 1,000 points. If you are earning less, then of course there is a link with some benefits. For example, bank credits to buy, the possibility to buy a ticket by train or by plane, uh, by plane, and other things, to get a visa for abroad, and to study in the university or in the better schools. And so the more and more uh, benefits are linked with the citizens' ranking. And it's interesting, <coughs> it is introduced by, by, by law, so to say, by, by the state, but um, it is accepted also by the individuals, by the society. Why? If you know a person, you can ask how many points you have. And <laughs> And uh, then, of course, you can appreciate the other person, and it is easy for, uh, for someone to know, ah, it's a more reliable person or less reliable person, and all the citizens are involved in the, in, in the producing, on the reproducing on the systems, because you are permanently ranking other people. And, uh, for example, also for uh, marriage, for, uh, for marriage for marriage. Uh, by marriage announcements, a woman is uh, looking for a man with at least 800 points. <laughs> and it's interesting that uh, the man is looking uh, for a woman, it is maybe 600 points would be enough. <laughs> but that of course means a social, if we are looking further, a social differentiation, so to say, in, in uh, in, um, in the, the new families will build up in certain uh, hierarchy of uh, citizens' ranking system. Uh, previously, it was, uh, it was uh, so to say, this, uh, the social status, and now could be this ranking system. It is, as I said, um, it is um, introduced by, state, by the state, by state law, but in principle, it is possible to introduce also by private organizations. So to say, we can organize in Latvia a ranking company, and then you can maybe after this lecture rank, they give a points, and I can give a points for you for your questions. And so, um, so we have, uh, we, it, it is possible in principle also to have this ranking system, uh, overall ranking system in each society which could be introduced also not only by public institutions, but also by private, private institutions. And it is uh, for, the, for an individual, it is of course uh, interesting and good to know, but there are your, po your points. For example, by, by, uh, by uh, the interview, if you are a candidate for a vacancy, that's of course very interesting. Um, so, but um, what means such a ranking system? And I assume that 2020, when in China it would be introduced globally, then it would have also um, also uh, uh, some uh, some repercussions for the other part of the world. I, I said it's only two provinces now. Um, that means that uh, all persons would uh, have the intention to be in the mainstream, to be good for the state, to be good for other people. And of course, this is a philosophical question, and the question, what, what is a real personality? Is the intentions, as the intentions that I have, are coming from myself, for the deep of myself, or I am looking how the system looks, how uh, as a 
preconditions when I, uh, in order to get uh, more points, to have more benefits. And uh, this system will completely destroy the democratic philosophy, because the democratic philosophy is that um, as a citizen, you have a choice. The choice is, is came from my, my uh, I would say not uh, history, but by my, for my biography. We are all prisoners of our biography now. What I'm saying now, it's, so to say, all what I have experienced in my life and each of person. And then you have this uh, specific uh, goals to be a good citizen, good in, uh, in brackets, um, and to have the more chances of life. And uh, as a court of justice, we have also, uh, in the last time, more and more also to deal with small parts of such systems, these ranking portals, you know, uh, where you can rank the medicines, uh, 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 certain companies. You can, let's say, if you are asking for a craftsman, craftsman to do something, after that you can rank his work. And of course, uh, this creates uh, some, some legal problems, but if it is not an overall system, then it works more or less uh, well. But if it would be an overall system, like in this experiment, social experiment in China, then of course uh, this uh, would be uh, uh, completely, uh, completely uh, different. Why the private surveillance and also the ranking? But ranking is uh, now not uh, so big problem in the Western democracies, but I will say that it would be in a few years because it's a good idea for a company to have also some, uh, some benefits from, uh, from, such, uh, from introducing of such a system, overall system. Why the private surveillance of the citizens is problematic for the democracy? Um, that leads me to the second aspect of uh, digital threats, although the first is surveillance, and the second is big data problem. Big data and democracy. Is, uh, there is very, not very much literature about that in, in the uh, legal science, but already uh, a lot of literature in the social and political science about big data and repercussions of big data to the society and to democracy. But my theory is that law is always a function of politics. Uh, poli uh, the law reflects politics. The politic is the first uh, so area and the second area law follows. And therefore, if it is a political question, it would be, or it is already also a legal question. What means big data? Big data means, in this context here, interconnected different data about a person which usually are not connected. It's a, so to say, a very simple definition of big data. Big data contains data which are not collected for one specific purpose. This is important, for not for one specific purpose, uh, but for different purposes and putting together. With special algorithms from all the data, it's possible to find correlations which allows prediction of the probability of a situation, an occurrence, or the behavior of, the person, of a person. The result uh, to the behavior, the result in respect to the behavior of person is achieved by using of four different methods which are use, used in the same time. First, tracking. Second, personalizing. Third, scoring. And fourth, uh, fourth profiling of a person. With these four uh, methods of big data, you can have a profile uh, of a person which allows uh, to predict the behavior of a person if uh, you uh, 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 
to predict the behavior of a person in a specific situation. Of course, there is a lot of situations where the use of big data could have positive effect to the economy or the well-being of the society. For example, the using of big data could help to organize some services closer to the customers. It's interesting in, in, uh, in the United States there is uh, uh, now uh, introduced in the police uh, work uh, the big data program which allows to predict in, uh, in which areas in, in today or into, uh, there would be more thefts. And then the police are, are, um, uh, are trying to go more in these specific areas. And you know, in this night, there would be left. <laughs> of course, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a reasonable use of uh, big data. On the other hand, it would be an irresponsible careless when we would not identify the, identify the danger of using big data for the democratic form of government. I say again, for uh, an individual in a specific situation, it can be a benefit to, from, to use the big data. For the society as a whole, it is for certain reasons dangerous. I will explain why. First, we should take into account the way how the people are receiving information, especially information which are politically relevant. More and more people are receiving this kind of information by the social networks. However, the news and other political information offered by the big social networks are, are far away of being neutral. It is enough only to mention the fake news or more dangerous, the open or hidden, hidden disinformation and propaganda which is targeted to achieve a special goal. What is important is that the individual user has no influence to the political information offered to him by social networks. The evaluation of big data which put together all kind of data about a person, makes it possible to obtain a very precise profile of his personality, including interests, habits, emotionality, it's very important, emotionality, and other parameters. As a result, users of social networks become separated from information that disagrees with their viewpoints, effectively isolating them in their own cultural and ideological bubbles. That makes it possible to foresee his or her behavior if, or if he or she would get one or another politically relevant information. And the political relevant information does not mean that it's obviously political. It could be a very banal information, but with a political repercussions through emotionality. For this purpose, um, So, and that means that big data is creating a global infrastructure, global technical infrastructure, which allows to influence the will of the citizens without the possibility to know that and to identify, identify this in, in information. Uh, the latest scandal about Cambridge Analytics, Analytics shows only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the mechanism of a more or less precise prediction of the reaction of a person destroys the equality of the people, equality of citizens, which is one of the highest valuated goods in democratic society. Why the total knowledge of the behavior of other people is destructive? Imagine a situation where two persons, A and B, want to conclude a contract. The person A knows how person B will react to his proposals one, two, and three. Person B no knows nothing about person A. Of course, it is uh, 
there is no more equality between the two persons, a person and the person I will choose his proposal, uh, knowing the reaction of another person. And of course, that is, uh, that is not more, um, not more uh, what, is, uh, what better meets the interests of the person A, who knows the reaction of person B. It's a very simple example, but already this example shows that this undermines the basic principle of private law, according to which there is a normative approach to equality of two contracting persons. Um, moreover, the predictability of the behavior of person is more dangerous in the, private, in the public sphere. We should bear in mind that there is a total asymmetry, a total imbalance of the data, and therefore the knowledge about the behavior of other people. The big data is collected in the hands of only a few globally acting companies. If necessary, they can, it is not uh, automatically, but if necessary, they can on the spot activate and use this knowledge and they can sell this knowledge. And uh, Cambridge Analytics shows that it's possible to buy for not very high price uh, to, to, um, uh, to the knowledge how the person he, which, which is sitting, who is sitting here, will react if I am feeding his, the, the person with a special information. And so, of course, for a, for, a, for a, so to say, political uh, needs, it's a very useful information, and um, it can be used. The global infrastructure of predictability could be used not only for commercial, but also for political aims, and um, certainly for elections. I will not say more about the influence in some elections in, in America, in France. Um, uh, it is also interesting to stress, or it is necessary to stress, that is, uh, in a democratic system, it is not necessary to influence, to manipulate the, uh, all the people. It is enough to manipulate only a decisive minority. A decisive minority could be 5 or 10% in order to achieve the majority. And the decisive minority is a special group which could be targeted. And this decisive minority, is, uh, calls in, in, uh, the decisive minority uh, have a specific characteristic. And this is interesting. The uh, decisive minority in this respect um, consists of two different groups. The one different group is a person with a strong political views. And um, if you uh, have this uh, decisive minority with strong political views, it's already the basis for the decisive minority. And then you have uh, the second group, it's necessary to collect the second group of the decisive minority, persons which, uh, which are not politically interested. And then together, which are easily to influence, uh, because they have no strong views. And this is persons, for example, uh, with strong, strong political views, uh, who are uh, not voting in all elections in the same way. In one election for one party, for the second election in the second party. And why? Not because you does not know who is the better, party, but you have your principles, and therefore you see in this election, my principles are more reflected by the party A, but in previous elections by the party B, and therefore I am, I am uh, not voting in the same way always. And the second group is absolutely, is the same behavior, but with uh, other motivation. I don't know who is uh, the better party, I will choose, so to say, more or less deliberately, without, without specific. And this uh, 5 or 10% decisive minority is enough to achieve the majority. And therefore, you can also see that uh, um, it's, of course, cheaper uh, not to manipulate all. Uh, but uh, there is also a possibility to manipulate the majority, and we can 
we can see in in in, in uh, some parts of uh, quasi democratic regimes not far away from Latvia, for example, was the majority is uh, very well organized in this way. So, uh, if um, such a system would be allowed, and it, if it would be um, developed, because we, you know uh, that today is also the beginning of this development, and in a few years, in maybe 10 years, there would be uh, a much more perfect uh, system in which can uh, use this infrastructure, and I'm calling this infrastructure, infrastructure which allows to predict personal behavior of each person. This is an infrastructure of prediction. And uh, we are now living in, the, in, in, uh, in a world of uncertainty. I can guess why, how you will react, so to say, to my uh, my uh, my action, and if I am more uh, so to say sophisticated, then I can better see. If not, then then not so good. But uh, if the system of prediction of another person is r rather perfect or quite perfect, of course this changes absolutely uh, the relations between the people. If you know the, his or her reactions. And if we, we can imagine that such a system can completely change and make the democracy, which is based on the assumption of free will, as I say, normative assumption, we don't know whether such a free will exists or not. It's not the case for the, uh, for the law or for the politics to give the answer, rather for philosophy, but we are saying, yes, there is, exists a free will. So, and then, uh, s such an infrastructure will destroy the system which is based on the free will of the citizens and we will uh, develop the democracy to a kind of post-democracy. Uh, which would be not a classical authoritarianism or totalitarianism. totalitarianism. It would be an authoritarian system which would have a cultural pluralism and the individuals would have the possibility to independent lifestyles. However, the people would not have the possibility to influence the political and, and economic structures of the society. This is different in this such kind of post-democracy in comparison with democracy. It would be uh, authoritarianism of a new style, a modern authoritarianism where the power lies in the hands of a few persons or international companies. That system have, would have little common with a democracy, but we have until now, despite the fact that formally, that formally the democratic institutions would probably continue to exist. Uh, it would, um, the, such a post-democracy would be um, authoritarianism without prisons, without, uh, without uh, secret police and rep uh, repressions and so, it's uh, only on positive motivation of the people to behave rightly. Rightly, uh, by defini and, and what is rightly would be defined by a few people, by a few international companies, and maybe by the state. Uh, this is, uh, so to say, the modern authoritarianism. Um, so I will come to the end, not not right, not right now, but some some uh, some things uh, uh, more. This is only one problem, which I uh, explained. So uh, what is a danger for a democratic system? Um, this uh, problem of uh, big data and informational technology. There is a lot of of other problems which we should solve or at least think about think about first i will only mention these problems technology uh, problems of which creates from 
uh, which creates technology, has a problem of algorithms, also in the sphere of law. Um, should we accept, as a society, hierarchical, hierarchical, hierarchical decisions which are not made by human beings but by algorithms? For example, we had a few months ago a seminar, could you, uh, judge be replaced by, by a machine? You give all the <laughs> necessary information and then you will get the judgment. Um, but it's also by administrative acts, uh, whether it is, uh, and this is, uh, I would say, a philosophic problem whether we should be, we should trust the uh, automatic decisions which is not made by human beings. There is pluses and minuses, uh, and I will not explain further, but it is one of the problem, and uh, it's interesting that uh, there is also in, in, uh, in um, also in legal science, uh, there are uh, some interesting developments how to do uh, that. Also, problem of algorithms. Uh, third, next problem is the problem of robotization. Uh, the responsibility for, uh, for robots and uh, especially for self-learning robots. And because the self-learning robots are less and less dependent from human will, and how to deal with these problems. Um, in international law, we have also a lot of uh, problems which arise, uh, which are based in, in the technolo technological um, development. One of uh, such a problem is the massive uh, over overlapping of the informational space of one state over the informational uh, space of another state, and uh, which is then manipulated on, in this way, whether it's possible or not in, in international law. A relatively small problem or very targeted problem is the problem of drones and war, uh, war by drones. And in 2016, more than 3,000 people were killed by drones, where the operators are sitting in one by, by monitor in, in one country, and the killed person is in a, another person. Until now, the drones are used rather uh, in the situation of uh, some kind of military conflict, but it's in principle thinkable that uh, it is possible also to kill a person in another country which is politically not, uh, not a very... <laughs> Uh, uh, so to say, uh, suitable for the first for the first person, and there is also some examples of such such kind of uh, technical killings without uh, without uh, without um, human involvement, direct human involvement, and the last problem, and I would say the last problem is the last problem for the humanity is the problem of artificial intelligence. Uh, the problem of artificial intelligence means that um, to a certain level, the artificial intelligence, which is self-learning, could, um, could uh, reach a point of no return. Point of no return means that there would not be possible for human beings to influence to stop them while they will be always better informed and more reasonable as human beings. And uh, it was 2015 a world conference of uh, the researchers of, uh, public, of artificial intelligence in Buenos Aires and uh, they uh, adopted a resolution about the dangers of, uh, of uh, artificial intelligence and it is adapted by the researchers which are doing that. And uh, there is uh, obviously not very clear when the point of no return will be reached, but it is between 20 and 50 years the point of no return will be reached. And then, of course, we are not thinking about that. 20 years is so to say, far away, but it's not so far away. And if we would uh, think about of, uh, a regulation of that, 
than we should start to think about now. Uh, so say this is a last problem, and then maybe all the problems of the humanity will be solved by, by this. <laughs> <laughs> so dear colleagues, uh, I can, uh, I, I would uh, uh, say only that uh, also the European Court of Justice is uh, to some extent involved in, uh, in the regulation of uh, this kind of problems, because, because on, on only in, in a, a, so to say, a restrictive way. But nevertheless, we are, the European Court of Justice is the only court which uh, deals with these problems, and uh, the judgments had repercussions not only for the European Union, for glo but global repercussions. For lawyers, until, for lawyers uh, here, I will mention some landmark decisions which should, uh, should be known. So to say that I would few of them uh, mention. Digital Rights Ireland, uh, concerning collecting of metadata by telecommunications, that it is uh, not possible to, uh, to collect metadata without specific target, specific aim. Google Spain, that means the right to be forgotten, it's also, this uh, is uh, very well reflected in the legal literature. It's a very complicated judgment, but so to say, in one word, the right to be forgotten, so to say, you can uh, uh, you can with a very complicated in a very complicated procedure to obtain that uh, your uh, data are, uh, are deleted from uh, from uh, Google. It's also interesting uh, the case Schrems about uh, so to say this is a safe harbor uh, decision. That means that uh, uh, we have compared the uh, level of protection of personal data in Europe with United States, and the uh, conclusion was that uh, in the United States, the uh, protection level is uh, lower, and therefore it is not possible to give data of European citizens to uh, United States, safe harbor. Then, Tele2 Sverige. It's from 2016. Um, it is also concerning uh, metadata of political uh, of uh, telecommunications, and there was more precisely said to which aims uh, it is possible of the combating serious crimes, crimes and and terrorism and so far, but not for all citizens which are not. Uh, <laughs> where there is <coughs> no suspicion that you are a, a terrorist, for example. This is Tele to Sveria is a very important decision. Then from 25th of January 2018, Schrems II, uh, it's possible also to involve the consumer rights in order to have uh, the control about, uh, about the data. And the big decision about all what I now spoke would be in the in the in the uh, judgment Schrems III. Uh, Schrems uh, III. Uh, that means uh, about uh, about behavior of Facebook, how uh, it is, uh, how the data is collecting, and especially by uh, the trading of the data and to giving legally and illegally the data of a personal uh, of a person to third uh, to third persons uh, to third third companies and also to use by facebook uh, itself uh, i mentioned three uh, times the name schrems schrems is an austrian student um, who is an uh, activist in this area, and you can see that one person, a student, can influence, uh, so to say, the legal situation in the European Union and also in, in the whole world through uh, specific activities. 
And uh, now he's, uh, he's writing books about himself. Shrems <laughs> 3. OK, uh, if uh, we want, we can discuss this and other judgments if we, if we have the necessity. And lastly, I would say that the area of new technologies is a largely a low free zone until now. But that does not mean that uh, this is a rule free zone, not a law free zone, but it is, but it's not also a rule free zone. But the rules are not set by the democratic institutions. The rules are set by private companies. The rules are set, for example, concerning censorship in Facebook. This is the owner, the owner who, who say, this is possible, this is not possible. There is no democratic legitimation. This, there is a rule, but it is not a law. Uh, this is a problem also for, for, uh, for, uh, for the politicians to make, to, to, to adopt the laws and instead of private rules. No, yeah, of course, it's a process. Yeah. And therefore, I mean that there is um, now the moment not only for the very fast technical innovations in, the, in, this, in the, this sphere, but also for interesting legal innovations in this sphere on European level, level but also on national level. And I would say that Latvia, as a small and smart, smart country, country can develop such a legal infrastructure, which would make Latvia very interesting, also in global sense, for uh, for this legal infrastructure for uh, other companies, other people, uh, because uh, we should not. Um, we should offer maybe a better regulation of national of personal data, better regulation of uh, surveillance and other systems, which would uh, and then we would have a certain uh, positive handicap in in uh, in comparison with other other uh, states. And it is, I would say, easy. Thank you. has agreed to uh, respond uh, to uh, your questions or, and uh, comments. Uh, before you uh, uh, pose a question, it would be nice if you could uh, identify your, uh, yourself. So um, do we have any uh, microphones? Uh, yes, great. So uh, you can start earning your points now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, first of all, thank you for uh, coming here. It was a uh, pleasure to listen to your lecture. Uh, I am, um, my name is Ryan Svox. I'm from, um, I'm a student here from the Graduate School of Law. Uh, my first question would be, what are your thoughts on the recent statement by Mark Zuckerberg that Facebook would not comply with all uh, the requirements of the regulation 2016, uh, 679 in regard to data handling? And, and would, in your opinion, would there be enough political will to brought, um, bring charges against Facebook in a case it, it uh, did not handle it in compliance with the regulation, uh, as the regulation states that, that it can be, the European Union can brought, uh, bring charges for that to handle outside the European Union. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have some insight in, in, uh, in uh, political process of adapting of uh, European regulation, for example, here in, in the data protection regulation. And you know that uh, all the regulation was adopted 95, and the new, which, is, which will be next month in, in force, it was adopted 2016. But the works, uh, the process starts already 2003 or 2004. It takes 13 or 40 years to adapt that. And why so long? 
but because there are many interests and many lobby groups to influence this, uh, um, to influence uh, the future regulation. And uh, I would say political will is uh, difficult to, to predict. I would say I, there is an infrastructure of prediction, but I, have, I am not the owner of uh, this system. I cannot predict if I would, maybe. So if I would, so to say, pay $1 million to a company which has this uh, data about the politicians which are involved, then I can say you maybe with 80, 90 percent probability what will happen. Uh, but uh, now I can only guess as a normal people until now, as all persons in the history, they, they have guessed what the other uh, will, will do. And I, uh, I would say that uh, there is an increasing sensibility about these uh, questions. And we can see that there is also a different sensibility in different countries of the European Union. Uh, the Germany is very sensible to that. Southern countries are not sensible. And Eastern European countries are, I would say, rather also not so, but, but maybe in, in between. Uh, it's also interesting that Scandinavian countries uh, are not sensible to the pr data protection because of uh, the high value of transparency, uh, which is also a constitutional value uh, there. And, um, but uh, but um, the judgment, uh, tell it to Sveria, I explained this for the Supreme, uh, Swedish Supreme Court, uh, our judgment there. After explanation, they more or less agreed, so, yeah, maybe it's, it's <laughs> so to say, uh, it is necessary to, to, um, to, to speak about uh, the dangers, the dangers. So I would say this sensibility will increase, but as you say from, from, uh, uh, from the example Schrems, it's also possible for you to introduce such, uh, such um, questions before the court. And um, then uh, the court is deciding autonomously without uh, political influences. This is only legal, uh, legal arguments. But legal arguments in the European Court of Justice are uh, very often also includes uh, political um, I would say um, aspects of the judicial decision. I would say uh, it was not possible what uh, Mr. Schrems achieved by the political parties in the European Parliament, but it was possible by him, by a student, and like you. Also, it's maybe <laughs> this is <the> answer. <laughs> okay. Ines de Birsnitz, what am I? Uh, EU consultant, uh, former MP in Latvia. Um, I think I was thinking about the analogy, especially in political elections. Previously, the legal regulation, uh, I'm thinking of US system, which I was where I came from before, uh, regulating uh, political ads, and you have to label who is paying for the ad, and there was at one time how much, a maximum amount of how much you could pay. Yeah. Also, in newspapers, supposedly you have opinions, are labeled as opinions, not news. Isn't this transparency is one of the key missing aspects when we don't the individuals aren't aware that they're of this manipulation? Yeah, um, this is one. This could be one of the aspects which would would increase, uh, um, so to say, the possibility of critical views of, of, of that. But also, without uh, if you know that uh, a person has paid about. Uh, on, on, on this article, for example, in, in, uh, in a newspaper or in, in, um, in social uh, social network. Um, if you know the person behind that, very often you can, without this, uh, uh, without this specific name, know, know already who is behind this idea. 
So to say it is a small tool, but it's better than nothing. If you are reading our Latvian newspapers, I think we can <laughs> guess <laughs> with a high probability. <laughs> Does it work? Yeah. Uh, my name is Solvit Herbacevic, and currently I'm from the uh, Supreme Court of Latvia. A uh, question which might seem excessively personal, but you do feel free uh, to answer it as impersonal as you'd like. I was listening to your lecture and thinking like, oh my god, I really should delete my Facebook profile, or, <laughs> <laughs> or I should seriously diminish the amount of information uh, which is accessible on it. But I mean, you recently created your own Facebook profile. <laughs> like, like, yeah, I, how, yeah, I, how, I created a few days ago. Yes. Uh, a few days ago, uh, because uh, there is a specific, um, specific security measures of uh, high officials for high officials of the European Union, and it is, uh, so to say, uh, recommended to have other profiles in in Twitter, in in in, in Facebook. Uh, it's it then more difficult for trolls to organize such a profile. And uh, for this reason, it's recommended to have these profiles. But I can say uh, it was too late for me in Twitter. There is already three, three <laughs> profiles with my name. <laughs> but it's not, but, but until now not used, but already reserved. In all honesty, when I saw your picture and my, and my information sheet, I thought, like, hmm, I have to check the friends to make sure it's not a troll yeah, yeah. because I yeah. never ever no, believed no, there there is, uh, on it. Yeah. Uh, this is also a kind what I, I mentioned, this informational war or hybrid war, which is a problem also of uh, technology. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So there is... Mr. Uh, Martin Paparinskis, University College London. Uh, I thought it was a very insightful point you made at the very end that uh, there are rules but not laws. I wondered whether you could speculate about the best way how one could develop laws. And I thought perhaps at a rather simplified level of abstraction, so if one direction we could think of classic formal rulemaking at the international level between states, which would provide, as you said, the legitimacy of the traditional sort. But then, I suppose we run into the problem you noted at the very beginning. Democracy is not global, and global rules are not necessarily going to reflect the democratic uh, perspectives. I suppose the other direction could be to go in the direction of uh, networks, communities of experts, like we have in banking matters, customs matters, phytosanitary matters, but those would also be at least one, if not two, steps removed from the democratic legitimacy. So perhaps I wonder whether noting the problems of developing rules that would respond to your normative concerns, the current practice of private actors that are most active within democratic states and have considerable incentives to comply with rules set by US and European Union might not be the least worst situation. Uh, how to create more rules uh, instead of private rules. Uh, this um, example of uh, censorship in, in, in Facebook um, is, of course, a absolutely private rule. The owner is, uh, so to say, the owner. <laughs> he can, uh, and uh, I think it is not uh, a, uh, not a situation which uh, could satisfy a democratic society because um, my proposal, 2007, for the Judicial Committee of European Parliament was to uh, organize a European public Facebook, a European public. Uh, maybe another Twitter or something. Uh, and the rules would be set by the parliament, by the democratically uh, legitimate organizations, what can be published, what should not be published, uh, how uh, the data will be uh, processed, and I would say not, 
not uh, not sold, not not sold, and therefore I. I but um, there was um, now. I think uh, there is. I, I have seen some some voices which are also going in this direction, but I I would say this is. A, Thinking in private, in the classical private law categories, when you are the owner of a company, normally you can do what you, you what you want. Uh, and now I would say that uh, some globally acting companies overstepped uh, their social, um, so to say, inf uh, the social importance of a private company. And therefore, uh, you should think about already in the public law categories. So, and if you are thinking in that category, then of course you, are, you can feel yourself legitimate to make some laws about that. For example, it would not be very efficient in, on Latvian level, but it would be uh, quite efficient on European level. Uh, to, and you can see that uh, the European Union is a very important uh, economic and also political actor in the world. And if such an actor sets some laws, rules and laws, then of course the, uh, the uh, globally acting companies would try to comply with this uh, system. But the problem is for the moment, I would say, the Polit political will, the possibility is, I would say yes, absolutely, there is a possibility and competence to do it. The political will, as your colleague asks for that, is now, I think, increasing. Increasing, but we are, I would, would compare the situation now in the, in the field of uh, this kind of technologies with the situation in the 70s and the 80s of the last century, when the awareness of, um, of en en environmental issues uh, were the first, uh, so to say, steps to think about environment. On, in the 60s, nobody cares about environment. In the 70s and 80s, the sensibility was more and more, increased more and more. And I would say since the 90s, it's recognized as a public Public uh, as a public uh, task to organize to to preserve the uh, environment, and it took maybe 20 years from the first green politicians or green philosophers in the end of the 60s. It was 68, I think, <laughs> uh, until the beginning of the 90s, when in the most constitutional provisions of the member states were introduced such an article about environment, also in, in Latvia. Uh, and now we are in this uh, problem of, uh, in, in this period of increasing uh, sensibility, and uh, say, and it is also uh, the task of the colleagues here to, to uh, help to fasten this uh, sensibility. Believe it or not, we are uh, transmitting, streaming this lecture live. Uh, it's supported on our website, and we are getting questions from viewers who are watching this lecture. So oh. I will read out one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a person who is identifying himself as Elmar Skechris, our graduate, is asking, you were talking about electronic decision-making concerning court judgments. If we consider EU as a united system, we should also talk about transparent, united, electronic law system in which every court case should be available online. We are talking about high-tech options, but we don't have a transparent information available in basic level. Is United Law System coming to EU? Yeah, uh, this is a different problem for what I spoke today. This is a problem how to use information technology in a legal system, in judicial system. And uh, this is a different problem. But I can say that uh, the European Court of Justice uh, last year organized, um, established um, so-called judicial network 
and where all the courts of the, Europe, of the member states are involved and to have a more easy or a relatively easy or quite easy access to the court decisions of all, all courts of the member states. You can, when, when it, it is now in, in the experimental phase uh, at the moment, but uh, maybe after six months or one year, it would be possible for, for here from Riga to obtain a judgment from Barcelona City Court from 2007, for example. Uh, so this is already, I would say, it, I would say done. Yeah. Willie Jama from Riga Graduate School of Law. You mentioned in your um, lecture that it takes 13 to 14 years for regulation to develop. 20 uh, years. Uh, 20 years. <laughs> I mean, do you not see this as a possible threat to technological advancement? We know that technology grows at a logarithmic rate, and uh, be it for good purposes such as medicine or, or bad purposes yeah. such as Cambridge Analytica, you know, the introduction, you said rules, yeah. the introduction of laws. I mean, would that not slow down technology? Yeah. Uh, this is a very um, so a good argument and also uh, very often used uh, against uh, against uh, so to say the regulations regulation of innovations. The problem is that um, we are now we have now reached uh, the situation where innovations are not innocent. Maybe 200 years when you discovered something, it was rather innocent for the, for the state, for the human beings, for the... Now, this is not more very innocent. Uh, I would say uh, um, the discovering or, or the technology of uh, atomic bomb, it's also an innovation but um, it could be very dangerous, dangerous, uh, uh, endangers the society, also the humanity, and it was regulated in the international treaties and so more or less. And now we have the situation that also innovations could also have some uh, dangerous repercussions to the society, and we should uh, weigh up what is what is more important. The, in individual freedom of researchers, uh, the commercial interest of the companies, or the public, uh, general public, or and and the um, uh, governmental order of democracy on the one side, or individual freedom of researchers and commercial interests of uh, of, this, of the companies, and then we can see yes by some questions, okay, commercial interests can prevail, by other, we could say, no, maybe public interests should prevail, and then we should spray, uh, so to say, different, um, differentiated this uh, innovations uh, in function of their repercussions to the society. This is uh, my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. yeah. Thank you for your interesting speech. Uh, yeah. And my question is, uh, how do you see the solution of predicting uh, the behavior of people with a political purpose? Uh, by prohibiting any data collection by private companies or maybe to organize the strict control which will ensure that collected data will, it will not be possible to somehow buy or get uh, this collected data by third parties. Thank you. Yeah. There could be different ways, and uh, maybe it's uh, much more a complex system so it should be established. For example, uh, the first step is the collecting of data. This is already, and this is, uh, I, th I think the public awareness of the first step collecting is already serious. 
The next, and this is not so uh, in the public awareness, the next step is putting together all the data. And this is uh, decisive. When all the data are put together, only then it is possible to organize, to, to establish a system of prediction. And I think this is completely now not a regulated area, or without some exceptions, for example, medical data is uh, not possible put together with other, but all other, uh, your behavior in, on internet, uh, here, so to say, all the data, what there is showing and, and searching uh, could be uh, used for organizing uh, of a profile. And, this, uh, and uh, it is now allowed, but it is also possible to say now nah, with some restrictions maybe is only allowed. Then the next step, the third step, is to sell these uh, profiles. Um, this is already also a question whether it's possible to, free, to freely sell that, to buy that. And the fourth step is if you have already bought a profile, if I I'm, have a profile of you, what I can do with this profile, whether I can feed you with a special informations in order to manipulate you, or it should not be such a... So in the four steps, you can, uh, you can have legal solutions in all, in all four steps. Uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation. And uh, I have two questions. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, the increase of new cases brought before the Court of Justice of the European Union after the uh, general data protection regulation will come into force? And the second question, uh, whether um, how you think whether the GDPR will achieve its purpose and uh, will restrict uh, such illegal data sharing and in the illegal uh, use of uh, personal data by big companies, uh, like in the Cambridge Analytic case. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the new data protection is uh, protection regulation is much more uh, better, much more effective as the old one. And uh, for example, the, uh, Google Spain uh, judgment was based on the old regulation, which is still in force in this month and not more next month. Uh, so to say, it would be a more, um, more controlled uh, processing of, of data, this is clear. Um, what, uh, and that led to the so to say, um, um, obvious answer to the first question. Yes, of course, we would have uh, much, more, uh, much more cases about uh, the interpretation of uh, the regulation. And the regulation, I can promise to you, is very, very complicated and very difficult to understand. And, um, and there would be uh, hundreds and thousands of questions. And uh, we have not a specialization of in, in our court, but um, we have some, some areas for a certain time as, as judges, and then they are changed. And I, I have uh, exactly these technological questions as a, my, my one of the, my areas. And uh, I know I I'm, I appreciate the new cases which will come. <laughs> just just to add to, to yeah. Elena's question, enforcement. Yeah. I mean the regulation. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, so to add to the question, um, mm -hmm. the regulation is all fine and good, but yeah. what about the enforcement? I mean, yeah. this is going to be an issue, is it not? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, the regulation, or, or uh, well, until now, not what was not regulation in a formal sense, but a directive. That means the national laws uh, were... Uh, regulated uh, uh, this uh, situation, and now we have a formal regulation. That means, without national laws, the European regulation is should be applied directly. 
That means the national regulations and na national implementations is not more necessary in direct sense, but in indirect sense. For example, some, some areas should be regulated in order uh, to uh, th that uh, the European regulation should should um, function well, then maybe some some uh, some national laws should be changed and, and so far. But uh, this is a directly uh, applied regulation, which should be directly applied, and uh, this uh, makes more easier uh, to for the implementation issue. And, um, Enforcement. Yes. Enforcement, you mean, uh, so to say, in individual cases? Individual cases, or yeah. to ensure that uh, compliance? Uh, yeah, uh, this is a task of the courts. Uh, also, they, the regulation should be, should be enforced, and if not, then it's for the individuals to go before the court and, and the end to the, before the court of justice. And uh, it could be also organized uh, NGO, for example, which helps the individual people to, to prepare court cases before national courts and then before the European Court of Justice. Uh, this is a one, one field of civic uh, activities. I would uh, say that would be a good, uh, let's say, um, task for, for, civic, uh, for civil activists. Hmm? We have one more question from our viewers, and somebody anonymously is asking, could you please comment how data protection regulation will impact EU, EU internet and social startup sector after Brexit, because companies in UK will not be obliged by these directives anymore? Yeah, uh, the status of, uh, of United Kingdom after the Brexit will be the same as each as uh, any other third country. Maybe there would be a certain specific regulations between uh, United Kingdom and Euro Euro European Union, but it is completely open. I don't know what, I, I think no, nobody knows that what will be the regulation. But if we, uh, we, we can assume that in, in a, in the worst case, or best case, I don't know, there would be no specific regulations between uh, United Kingdom and Europe in this area, and that means you, you, United Kingdom will be like, like uh, United States, or China, and uh, Nigeria, and uh, so to say, uh, as a usual third country, and this is a relation of European law, or I would say rather indirect repercussions of uh, the European law to third countries. I, I said already that there are indirect repercussions to the whole world of um, uh, regulations, so European regulations, that will be applied the same as to the United Kingdom. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as uh, we sense no further questions uh, to our uh, esteemed lecturer, I would like to thank him for his presentation and uh, already invite him back uh, on another occasion. Thank you. Yeah, merci. Thank you very much.